And this take us to our talk of the tape, the full run, which marks its two-year anniversary tomorrow. Let's welcome in Tom Lee, Fundstrat's managing partner, head of research, also a CNBC contributor. It's good to see you on this Friday. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Scott. Great to see you. I let in here with the fact that, you know, we have this streak going for stocks. We've above 5,800 for the S&P for the first time ever, though it seems to me from your notes that you're a little bit cautious as this month progresses. Why? Well, Scott, we're, we're cautious, but we advised our clients to be buying the dips. And the reason we're cautious is that, I, I'm, and I'm probably saying something very obvious, but I think investors want to see how who ends up becoming president after election day. So I think we are in a period where markets are just uh, sitting on the, the sidelines, but at the same time, 2024 has been such a strong year, Scott, that I think it, I think the last two weeks have proven that maybe macro is taking a little bit of a step back now and liquidity and all this cash on the sidelines is really the dominant factor. You think we just have to get the election out of the way and then it sort of clears the way for what you still think can be a pretty decent rally. I think your target's 6,000 or around that. Yeah, Scott, there's a lot of firepower uh, supporting stocks uh, post-election because we've got a bet that's dovish and the economy looks healthy. I don't think we're in a recession. And so I, I, you know, the three month and six month outlooks are very strong for stocks. And I think China, um, while there's maybe some hesitation, but China's government is really starting to unleash some measures and that's supportive of that region finally turning. And of course, the third factor is uh, I think after two years, investors who've been very cautious are starting to realize that, you know, the six trying to cash on the sidelines and the low levels of margin debt need to be put to work at a time when the Fed is supporting the economy. The other possible headwinds, I, I think, are, are ones that are maybe outside of the political cycle, at, at least as, as people, you know, refer to them. Valuations, they say, are, are too rich uh, or stretched, right? Um, the S&P is about 21 and a half. That's above, obviously, its historical average. Yields are up. Now, you could make the argument that they're up for the right reason, but I think they're still up a little bit more than people thought they might be after the Fed did its 50. And then yeah. if the Fed's going to be a little bit slower and smaller in the way they progress with rate cuts, is that an issue? Of course, the flip side of that is, well, why would they need to do anything anymore anyway? Because the economy is as resilient as you just suggested it is. Yeah. Um, well, on all those points... Um, Scott, you know, on valuation, I know people use the aggregate number for the S&P, but it, it is misleading because, as we know, uh, the top seven stocks uh, do have a higher deserve multiple, and the median P.E. is not that much cheaper, but it's around 18 times. But that's not a bad deal considering the 10-year yield is actually at 25 P.E. And with regard to the Fed cuts possibly slowing, you, you know, I think that the, what really matters now is the Fed is on a path to essentially normalize interest rates back towards neutral because the inflation pressures are ebbing. I mean, I think even CPI this week, even though it was a little hotter than expected, really didn't send a signal that inflation is reaccelerating. And so the Fed is, you know, on a path towards, you know, towards 3%. And, and I think that's really constructive for stocks. Well, let's say we can all kind of come to agreement because I think we could say that the consensus is bullish at this point. People think stocks are gonna go higher from here because the economy and, and rate cuts. The principal disagreement among the crowd at this point appears to be where? Where do you need to be positioned to take advantage of a market that looks like it really wants to go higher? You obviously have suggested that small caps could have the opportunity to have the biggest jump between now and the end of the year. That's a controversial view because you know, if yields are elevated, if the economy is slowing at least a bit, or there are questions around it, maybe those stocks don't do as well. I thought it was interesting, the thoughtful commentary that Ricky Sandler put forth of eminence yesterday on social media to where he says the best place to play offense, and he thinks you should play offense, are in below mega cap companies that have interesting earnings uh, equity stories at mid to large cap not mega but mid to large and he doesn't say small so how would you how would you argue your points against those um i mean I, i'd say that we're on the same side of that line which is uh market breadth is expanding and he sees a better risk reward 
uh, in mid to large just because he, uh, I think there are some reasons, you know, there's argument that maybe you can find higher quality and longer histories. But I, I think that small caps really do perform when the market is believing we're having a soft landing. I don't think that they can make that case in their mind yet until after election day, whether or not Harris or Trump is president. But I think once we're through that period, I think small caps not only have you know underperformance as 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 a tailwind, but it's really and I know I'm repeating myself, but median PE of a small cap stock is 10.7 times. It's like seven turns cheaper. You know, we're already looking at third quarter earnings growth of 43% versus around under double digits for S&P. So you're getting better growth. But I think small caps probably do better if Trump uh, wins just because of potential for deregulation and M&A. So I think that's why election day probably is a, is a pivot point for small caps. Would you agree with Mr. Sandler that, you know, the market at the index level is both expensive and consensus? And that's why, you know, he has the urge to look elsewhere. You know, mega caps are underperforming, or at least the NASDAQ is today. And, and maybe that's how the story is going to end up playing out for at least two of those reasons that he mentions. Well, I think if someone thinks PEs mark the top of stocks, then people are cautious. But to me, the PE is rising because the US economy and companies survived a stress test, Scott. We had a pandemic, we had global trade stop, we have a, a huge inflation cycle, the Fed, the fastest rate hikes in history. Let's say four things have just bombarded corporate earnings and companies are producing record profits. So to me, they survived a stress test that warrants higher multiples. Um, I just don't personally think 20 times for a, a category leading company is expensive, even 25 times. And, and you know, like if we're talking about NVIDIA, you know, sh what, 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 I don't know, I'm sure the cap should be 30. So I, I think that we have this uncomfortableness because PEs are rising, but I think companies have really survived, you know, four cataclysmic stress tests too. Thomas brought the conversation. Let's welcome in 